Good evening, everybody. Good evening, welcome. We are live from Books and Books here in Coral Gables, Florida. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. With the thanks to the Knight Foundation, of course, for their generous support. Uh, just a reminder to our internet audience, if at any time during the presentation this evening you'd like an autographed copy of the book, just give us a call on the number on your screen and we'll get a copy signed for you and we'll ship it to you free of charge anywhere here in the U.S. Uh, for those of you who are here, we talked about silencing your cell phones and don't forget to pick up a copy of the Books and Books newsletter. This, of course, can be found on the counter where tonight's books are being sold. This will give you a breakdown of all the great events we have at Books and Books. We do nearly 60 a month, uh, sometimes four a night. We have kids' events, Spanish events, first-time authors, poetry readings, and, of course, celebrity signings as we do this evening. And, of course, when you visit our site, please give us your email address so we can alert you to everything that goes on here so you don't miss anything. You can also follow us on on Twitter, on Facebook, we're everywhere. So don't forget also to visit our newest location. Books and Books now has a store and a cafe down at the Arch Center downtown in the historic uh, Sears Tower there. That's a great place to visit if you're down there. Uh, so don't forget to put that on your agenda. But tonight we are very happy to have with us actress, director, singer, and dancer Jasmine Guy. Uh, here to formally introduce her. Here to formally introduce Miss Guy is the director of the South Dade Cultural Center. Please welcome Mr. Eric Fliss. Thank you, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Eric Fliss, I'm the managing director, and uh, I'm just thrilled uh, to be able to partner with Books and Books on this great occasion. Uh, I've been living in Miami for almost 30 years, and uh, I've known Mitchell and Mitchell's mother and the whole Books and Books family for a very long time. And as the director of the South Miami Dade Cultural Arts Center, I was trying to think of the right way that I could interact with Books and Books and bring another great artist to Books and Books. So when the opportunity came to uh, bring Miss Jasmine Guy and the fantastic Avery Sharp Trio to the South Miami Dade Cultural Arts Center in Cutler Bay, I reached out to, to Mitchell and I said, look, this is a great opportunity. Miss Guy has a, a fabulous book she wrote and I think it would be a great opportunity to sit and have a discussion about a great period of time, the Harlem Renaissance, and to uh, bring Miss Guy and the Avery Sharp Trio to, to, to Coral Gables and introduce some of you to the South Miami Dade Cultural Arts Center, which you may or may not have ever been. And so it's just, uh, to tell you, it's just a 25 minute drive down the road. We bring world-class artists, ballet, uh, contemporary, world music, jazz, uh, pop, uh, national touring acts of Broadway, and we have a, a, a formal thousand-seat theater, and we have a beautiful, beautiful cabaret where we bring jazz artists and, and comedians and a variety of entertainment. And so we're, we're just thrilled to be able to be in the community, uh, working with the community, and uh, Miss Guy and the Avery Sharp Trio today performed their show, The Harlem Renaissance, which they'll be performing tomorrow at the South Miami Dade Cultural Arts Center. This morning, for over 900 kids from the Miami Dade County Public School System, and it's an amazing thing to see these young men and women get such a great uh, experience with a fantastic group of professionals and talking about real things that are really important, not only when it happened in its era, but still relevant this day. So. Please help me to welcome to the stage Ms. Jasmine Guy. Hello, good evening. good evening. I'm a little dazed. I've never seen a bookstore like this. This is one that this ain't the Barnes and Noble I thought we were walking into. This is wonderful. We had a great um, 10 a.m. But who's counting? Matinee today. And those kids just, it, it overwhelmed me how enthusiastic they were because I'm thinking, oh, they're gonna be bored, they're not gonna be listening, they, this was 100 years ago, they're not gonna appreciate it. Not the case. In, in doing our show, Raising Cain, our goal is always to see the relevance, not only in, the, in our history, our collective history as Americans in this country, but also that those voices, songs, messages, that artwork is still very relevant today. And um, every time I do the show, I find a new way to bring it home to people. And that these kids, and some of them little boys were a little nasty. All I did was take, I just did that, you know? And they were like, ooh. <laughs> And I said, oh my God, I could be their grandmother. I can't believe that. That makes me feel weird. Like I was like, um, 
Am I complimented? But what I love the most is that when the musicians had their solos at the end of the show, and they let loose, and they were feeling it, and it wasn't necessarily a rap song that they knew or a hip-hop song that they knew that they really appreciated the essence of the music and the musicianship. It heartened me because they wore it out. They always come up with things that I've never seen before. It's my gig to come up with something they haven't seen before, but it has been such a joy to do this show over the last eight, nine, ten years. I've known Avery for 30 years. Yeah, we met doing Bubbling Brown Sugar. I was in the chorus. Avery was uh, one of the, the band members, uh, of course, the bassist, but, um, and we used to do bed and breakfast while everybody else was doing hotels. We were saving our per diem. <laughs> so we travel England and Germany doing bed and breakfasts, and that's how we became friends. But he's taught me a new way of performing. And, um, I'm in a very rigid business. I've been in musical theater. I've been at Alvin Ailey Musical Theater, television, film, which is very rigid about what we can and cannot say. I've always had to find a way to say what I want to say within the confines of what they give me to do. That was just the, the gig. But Avery has taught me how to jazz act, how to be open enough to the immediate need of the audience at the moment, which scared the mess out of me. I kept going, where's my five, six, seven, eight? I can't hear it, because they'd just be like, boom, 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 boom. I'm like, okay, and when, when do I do my 16 counts, you know? No, you're not gonna choreograph it. You're gonna feel it, just like we're feeling it every night. Um, that's been very exciting to me, I mean, I've come from a kind of rigid way of even if it's crap, do the crap first and make it good. Or do exactly what we want you to do and try to find your voice within that. And Avery has allowed me to be a new kind of artist, you know, even in, in this part of my life. And because of what we're talking about, which is the voice of the artist, in the 1920s, and how important that voice was, how the money flowed into Harlem during that time, what the spirit of the country was, against what was going on politically, that there was a freedom, and there was a chance for us to be lovely and beautiful and to mix and to feel like we love each other, you know? which is very, very New York, but it's also very American. That's the America that I know, it's not the America that we see. And the last thing I want to say is that this show is still relevant because every time something happens in the news and I go to do the show that night and I go to say one of these poems, that poem has a new meaning for me that I didn't even get the first time I read it. You know, and I realize, wow, we're still fighting to all be Americans together. There's nobody like the American. I don't care, black American, Native American, Irish American, whatever. We have a, a country. And, and, you know, my Jamaican friends have taught me this because they're like, why you keep saying you're black and you're white? We just say we're Jamaican. I'm like, well, you know, we don't do that in America, where we would just say we're American. Why not? I said, I don't know, because there's nobody more American than me. I come from immigrants, slaves, and Native Americans. You know, who's, who's more all-American than me? But it's part of the way we're, we're being taught and part of the way we're teaching our kids, you know? And I hope this show can help bridge that gap, can see the truth, face the truth, say I'm sorry, say I'm happy, say I'm proud, and all do this together. Because we, none of us have done this on our own. So 
That's all I wanted to say. And thank you for having us. And this is Avery Sharp. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how we kind of got together and just to echo some of the things that uh, Jasmine was talking about in that um, one of the great things of, about America is that uh, American, in, in particular, African Americans help create jazz or American music. American music would not sound the way it sounds if it hadn't been for African Americans. And um, there was a certain, uh, obviously, a mixture of cultures and a mixture of, um, of what Africans bought to this, to this uh, country. And I think Cornell West said it best, if, if I'm paraphrasing this correctly. He said that the people who were afforded the least amount of de democratic process actually created the most democratic process in America, which is jazz. And that is like, for instance, when you hear us play tonight, it's like the soloist is like the person who's at a town meeting and they have their say. And then the other musicians are supporting them. So it's, I mean, it's, it's the most democratic thing that, that, that we've created uh, in this music. And all that is part of the Harlem Renaissance. It was a freedom, it's not only a freedom of expression in terms of poetry, it was also a, a freedom of expression in terms of music. We had greatest art artists like Duke Ellington, Fats Waller, Bessie Smith, and all the stuff that we're hearing now would not sound the way it, it does if it hadn't been for those people, people before them, and Africans. Um, and with that, it's very, that's, I mean, that's, I'm just going off a little bit. That's why I love jazz so much is because it's still growing. It's never, even the music, I mean, the, I wrote the music, most of the music for the play, I wrote music indicative of the 1920s, but I also wrote some modern stuff as well because those, poet, those poems are like timeless. They're still relevant. A lot of things that we, that we were going through 100 years ago, we're still going through. And um, so it's, it's, it's just been a, a, a real gas also to, to, watch, to watch Jasmine and to kind of get into the flow because jazz musicians, we just, like tonight, we're gonna play. And I kind of have an idea what we're going to play, um, but it's it's never script. In other words, even if we play the same tune, it do, it's never going to sound the same. As I, I, I was, Jasmine and I were having a conversation the other day, and I told her, I used to always tell my kids, I have the greatest job in the world because it's my job not to sound like I sounded last night. And as jazz musician, they we, we all can vouch for this. If I play something that I played the night before, we'll kind of look at each other like, mm. <laughs> okay, we've heard that before. S surprise me. So, I mean, that, that's the great thing about uh, the music. That's the great thing. That's how music in this, in this country grew, and that's how it's, it's still growing. And we tried to get that together with the musicians and with the actress to kind of make that organic thing happening. So every time you see it, it's different. It's growing. So hopefully if you see us, invite us back next year, it'll look a little different. But um, I'd like to also uh, introduce our uh, violinist, uh, the great Miss Diane Misero. <laughs> Diane Munro. Good Lord. And the uh, gentleman on, that's going to be on drums and percussion, uh, you may notice he looks a little bit like me. That's because he's my brother. He's the, he doesn't like to hear this, but he's the baby of the family. He always says he's just the youngest, but uh, he's number eight. I'm number six. So, but my brother, Kevin Sharp. Um, so I guess maybe we should open things up for uh, Q&A, anything that uh, you want to ask us or about the play or whatever. Yes. Well, uh, Gene Toomer um, wrote a literary work in uh, 1921, 1923, um, during the Harlem Renaissance uh, called Cain. It was a little different. Uh, it was part poetry, part short story. It was People hadn't really written that, that way before. And Kind of he was rediscovered again in that sort of 1960s when the whole 
black movement, social movement was kind of happening in the 60s. And uh, he was kind of rediscovered by black artists. And he had a great impact on the Harlem Renaissance. So a friend of mine, who's actually a classical musician, actually moonlights as a playwright. And he's been writing like these short um, musical portraits uh, for classical musicians. And I had written some, some quote unquote jazz pieces for him because classical musicians really don't improvise. Jazz musicians, that's, that's our vocabulary. That's the, our main vocabulary. We have a structure, you learn chord, you know, chord structure, you learn melody, and then you, you improvise on it. So anyway, he had written these classical portraits, musical portraits. He used actresses like Sandy Duncan, uh, Vanessa Redgrave, a bunch of other people. He would write like Robert Schumann, great classical composer. And rather than write it from his colleagues or his wife's uh, point of view, he would write a fictitious story from the daughter's point of view. Because when Schumann died, his wife had to go on the road. She was a uh, pianist as well and support the family. So he wrote these musical portraits interge interjecting uh, Schumann's music all through the portrait. So he wanted to do something on jazz. So we started talking and, and he said, well, you know, Gene Toomer's name keeps coming up when you ever hear the Ra Harlem Renaissance. Why don't we do something on the Harlem Renaissance? I was like, cool. And he came up with the name Raising Cain, sort of a, a, a play on words, you know, re resurrecting Cain and also raising Cain. You know, so that's kind of how the name came about. Music? Yes. <coughs> I'm Frank Consol from WDNA. I just want to welcome you back to Miami. Oh, and thank you. Uh, say that uh, we had a pleasure to, two years ago. And also, uh, I might tell everybody here in the audience to check out your Sojourn of Truth. Of course, that was in my top 10 for the year. Oh, One of thank the best you. CDs I've heard in years. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> yes, I, I was here about two years ago. I can't remember where I played. Okay, thank you. And uh, the radio station sponsored bringing me down. It was really nice. And I did my uh, last project was on Sojourner Truth. I mean, I, I love writing. I mean, yes. Well, uh, well, a couple of things. Um, when we first did the piece, uh, Harry had c contracted a, an actress to do it, and, um, and they didn't like her, so they called me. <laughs> <laughs> I saved you that ten minutes of trying to fix whatever. Yes. <laughs> it's it's not like that. It's not like that. <laughs> I didn't think Jasmine would be interested. So I didn't call her. So and plus Harry had this actress that he had in mind. It didn't work out at all. It was horrible. Did I say horrible? Yes, it was. So then I said I said, "Hey, why don't we call Jasmine?" And I called her sent her the script and she said, "Yeah, sure. I'd be, you know, Kane's like my father's favorite piece of literature." Like, yes. So she came in 30 seconds. The first 30 seconds she read it, I was like, "Boom." She, she owns this. And um, that's kind of how we, we got together. And um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, poetry, those were some of the mainstays, like Zora Neale Hurston, Claude McKay, uh, Langston Hughes. Those were, those were names that people are kind of familiar with. And in terms of the, uh, the music, I mean, you, you can't get by Duke Ellington or, or Fats Waller. Um, so that's that's kind of how that whole thing came about. There was, there was so much in that first reading that it felt like a lecture. You know, I was just like, for me, um, there was so much information. There's still a lot of information in the piece, but what I was drawn to was the um, historical, um, political dynamic between Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and Marcus Garvey. And I said, 
we, we can't gloss over the fact that there were three very different ways of, of black people finding their way, you know, which have now trickled down to, um, you know, the Garveyites became um, the, the Muslims and the Black Panthers and the, the Boisean camps were like the ones that went to college and then um, my ex-mother-in-law loved Booker T. Washington because it was about if you work hard, you'll get, you I mean, very different ways of thinking and approaching life and how you're going to raise your child, <coughs> you know. Um, and I wanted to make sure that that came through in the piece because we had so much art and poems um, and literary pieces and music I wanted people to see, like, it's been a hundred years, but what's really different, we're still divided in the way we're trying to get to this point. And I didn't even understand that until I did the, the play, and I realized, wow, we're really coming. You know, like, they acted like Barack Obama came out of nowhere. Like, he was a freak of nature. He was clean. Didn't they think he was clean? Thank God. We <laughs> wouldn't want no funky president. <laughs> but I came from a uh, from Atlanta, where I grew up with, um, you know, Maynard Jackson, Andy Young, John Lewis, um, Benjamin Mays. He wasn't a freak of nature to me. Like I, everybody always made such a big deal of something that I grew up with. And I realized being on his first campaign that I need to tell these people he's not a freak of nature. He's not just coming out of nowhere. And um, I directed a piece about Martin Luther King. It was an opera. And I had to go through the King family to get permission to do to the piece. Oh, Lord. And I had to talk to um, Coretta's older sister. And she was just, she just wanted to make it clear that he was not coming from slavery in a sharecropper. I said, no, I understand that. I know Daddy King was educated. I grew, up, uh, I grew up across the street from Daddy King. There, were, there was a legacy of educated black people that raised educated black kids that he came from. Everybody's not coming from that same story. You know what I mean? But people don't know that. Our kids don't know that. I felt, I felt guilty that I don't really have a ghetto story. I have a, a middle class story. I'm like, my story is boring. I went to performing arts high school. I studied ballet, you know, it's like, but that's not all our story. It's not all the American story, and what is that other part? And that, to me, Kane does that. It fills in some of that gap, even for the immigrant, you know, the Jamaican immigrant, like Marcus Garvey or Claude McKay, you know, um, and how people want to be called man, woman, artist, first. That's how my daddy is. I'm a man first. I'm not a black man, I'm not raising my girls to be black women and whatever that means. And, but I embrace all of it and I don't think our kids know enough about what to embrace. I just don't think we give them enough information. We go from Harriet Tubman to Martin Luther King. We leave out a whole lot of information and it's our jobs as parents to supplement that information, and that's what the show does for me. And I, I do want to mention that it, the uh, play was written and conceived by Harry, but as she said, this has gone through a process, and she actually, this she did an adaptation. In other words, she, we, she helped rewrite the story. So what you're seeing now is not Harry's original vision. It kind of is and it kind of isn't. So a lot, and that's uh, response uh, is because of uh, Jasmine. Yes. Avery, thank you, and I'm Jasmine. Thank you for coming to our city.
City. Um, I appreciate you being here. Is there room for another Harlem Renaissance in America? And if yes, where and when? Well, it's a little more difficult, and this is my own personal opinion. I think because human beings, we always think that when we're living this time that this is it, not forgetting that things come in cycles. There's a, a gentleman who wrote a book, a two gentlemen who wrote a book about uh, 80 years, I can't think of, I can't think of who it is, but they said like 80, every 80 years something major happens because each generation forgets and before you know it, you're back at the Holocaust. It's kind of what's happening now. We're kind of getting at the end of that. We had that whole big period after World War II, this, this major shakeup in the vertex or whatever, and then people just um, prosperity, and then people also started to rebel and you know tried to break out of their bonds. And now we're kind of getting to a point where we're doing drone attacks, people we don't even know. Like you don't even have to send people. I'm sorry I'm getting a little off here, but you don't have to even send troops. You just send a, a drone. So it's like we're getting to a period now where there's probably going to be some things that are going to be happening because, you know, people are going to say, like, wait a minute, what are, we, what are we doing here? Then they look back in the history and say, ah, oh, you know, they did that 80 years ago or they did that 100 years ago or they did that. So I, I think artists will kind of awaken people because that's kind of always been the thing where um, the great thing about being an artist is that you can express yourself and you kind of tell the or you kind of express what's happening around you, you know, culturally, economically. So I think eventually, yes, I, I think eventually we may have some kind, it may not be, because I mean, you know, whenever there's a renaissance or whenever there's a movement, no one ever really sits down and calculates that. It's an organic thing. Before you know it, it's like, ho, this whole thing happened and what, you know, what happened? So it, it's, there's, there's a lot of the seeds there for it, for it to kind of happen, I, I think. And I think eventually it will because people get tired of bull. I mean, you can't fool how did our president, George, some of, you can't fool some of the people some of the time or <laughs> all the time. Well, you can't fool me all the time or whatever it is. <laughs> so I, I think eventually that things will come around. was old enough to appreciate hip hop but not be in and of it, but it was the voice of the streets. Um, I remember when there was no hip hop category for the Grammys. I remember when Dr. Dre and a lot of the rappers were like, let us in, let us in. Um, I remember when Oprah wouldn't have no rappers on her show even though she loves them now. <laughs> okay. I'm like, Oprah's hanging out with Snoop? When did that happen? <laughs> okay, but so I think that we are in movements without, I mean, we don't know it's a movement. I used to say, well, my sister mostly, because she wanted like this kind of romantic idea of what it was like growing up in the olden days when you couldn't sit in the front of the bus, you know. And my father, who is um, 78, grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and was not one of the Little Rock Nine, but was there during that time. He's from Little Rock. But he kept saying us, but, you know, he was at Morehouse when Martin Luther King was. He was a freshman. Martin Luther King was a senior. He said, well, I didn't realize he was gonna be Martin Luther. You know, it's like, well, give me a break here. It's not like I'm not telling you stories, but you don't really know that this bus boycott that your your ex-classmate is, is gonna do is gonna change history. You know, kids want to be part of a movement. They want to wear the back black beret and the and the leather jacket, but you know, Panthers were also considered gangsters and, and militants. And it wasn't like all black people wanted to be Panthers. They were almost like outlaws, you know. There was still different ways of thinking, you know. They were thinking out. And then there was, we, we never talk about communism and socialism and really what those concepts were 
for those young people, those young educated people coming out of the college system, but we don't talk about it. And um, they took risk. Angela Davis was an outlaw. They were looking for her, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we say movement and all that now because in, in, you know, in retrospect, it seems very romantic and very hip and it looks cool. But being in jail ain't cool. And going to jail for what you believe in is still not something that I see a lot of young people doing. But we are constantly in movements. To me, raising my child is a movement. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not gonna be a big deal, but if I get Imani to adulthood and she's happy and she still loves me and we're okay, that's gonna be a movement. <laughs> I applaud all of y'all, anybody that got a baby. And he got four, so. who used to run on Thursday night to their girlfriend's dorm room <laughs> to watch a different world. And I wanna and I wanna bring it up because at that time, and still now, but more so then, there were so few black faces. And as a child of immigrant parents, and I had no one in this country to tell me what college looked like. My mom knew that I just needed to go. She couldn't tell me what was gonna happen, how you register. She just was like, you gotta go. So apart from the great storytelling of that show, I just can't explain to you how important it was to see myself and see the potential. Your mom can tell you, but if you don't, if your culture is not showing you someone that looks like you, it's hard for you to believe that you too can do something. So you say that you had to take on these roles um, and then find the message, get the message out there the best you could with what you had. So I'm telling you that you did it. <laughs> um, and it's, I, I speak on behalf of a whole gang of gal pals and people sitting here and we're just so afraid to bring up different world but I'm just gonna <laughs> bring it up <laughs> because that, sh that was so important so thank you that, that's um, very moving to me I just want to say why I'm hesitant to um, begin to take credit for something that I really, you know, I'm an actor, I'm a performer, I wanted the gig, I did the best I could to get the gig. It wasn't my brainchild. I didn't even understand. I grew up across the street from Morehouse. My father taught at Morehouse. So I didn't even know that people didn't know. It, it didn't seem like a big deal to me you know, literally across the street, like driving my, riding my bike on the campus of Morehouse in Spelman while I was growing up. And I was uh, 25 years old by the time I got A Different World. I'd already done school days. I met Spike when I was in Atlanta. I grew up in an environment that fostered that. So, it took years for me to realize that there were so many of us out there that didn't even understand that that wasn't how it normally is. You know, I'm grateful that God put me in that position, but I hesitate to take credit for what I didn't have anything to do with, you know. And then my relationship with the Whitley Gilbert character has been one of... Um, how many, eight years of therapy I've been through? <laughs> How many thousands of dollars? 
because I basically was playing a character that I was accused of being all my life and getting my ass kicked for. And it, I was in conflict. I mean, I was like, I can't believe I'm playing somebody that not only am I not like, but that I have been, uh, that, that image had been um, imposed upon me. You know what I mean? I wasn't a debutante. Uh, my mother is a white liberal from Massachusetts. I couldn't even join any kind of uh, ball or contest, you know. Anyway, I don't, I'm not going into that with y'all, but I'm just saying I, um, it took a lot for me to embrace not only the show and um, but also the impact the show had on our lives as a culture. But I really credit Bill Cosby for having the vision to set it on an HBCU. I mean, he could have spun anybody off from his show and he chose Lisa Bonet to go to an HBCU um, he had the power and the clout to make that happen at NBC. As I tell my daughter, there were only three channels at that time, <laughs> you know. Um, and, um, and, the, and the same with Spike Lee and working with him. I, I did School Days before I got A Different World. Actually, I got A Different World because of uh, School Days, who went to Morehouse, you know, and then NYU. But for me, I feel like it was their vision more so than my own. And I was a part of a wonderful whole where I could be and say the worst possible things politically as, as far as I'm concerned and know there was balance. Now, when you're the only black person on the show, you don't have that kind of freedom, you know. But I could say, you know, I parked in the handicapped place because why should I be punished? Because I can walk. <laughs> because somebody on the show is going to at least confront that. But when you have to hold the whole race up on your back while you're trying to be funny, you ain't going to be funny. I'm going to let you know that right now. <laughs> you know, I could be funny because we had a diverse community of actors and black people on that show. We had black characters we had never seen before. We weren't the only one, like Boom Boom Washington on the Sweat Hogs. That's what I grew up with, you know. Where you could do that. And we brought up so many things, you know. But, but again, while you're doing it, I didn't realize I was part of a movement, you know. Um, I think we're going to wrap this portion of it up, and I think we're going to do what the three of us do best, and that's play some music. <laughs> Once again, Miss Diane Monroe on violin. <laughs> Kevin Sharp on uh, drums. <laughs> and yours truly, Avery Sharp on bass. I guess originally we were going to. Uh, Y'all can tune up again because it's hot in here, right? They tell me their strings and everything changes all the time. Yeah. Me, 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 me,
Yeah. I gotta use this as a music stand, you know. Okay. I'm not embarrassed. It's a little cumbersome, but okay. That's cool.
say in jazz, all plans are subject to change. The two comments in peace that you want just for the souls. Okay. So. Um, I'll play. I'm going to do a solo piece based on the blues. Kind of start out maybe like Bessie Smith and then see where it goes from there. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, just hang on. <laughs> <laughs>
Since that hasn't been named yet, you got any ideas for a name? <laughs> books and Books Blues? That's <laughs> <laughs> um, Right now, I'd like to uh, feature our violinist, uh, Diane Monroe, on a solo piece. I'm not sure what she's going to play, but I know it will be incredible. And um, also, I'd like to acknowledge a great friend of mine, incredible jazz musician who decided to come here and honor us with his presence. How about uh, Mr. Kevin Mahogany? Sometimes looks like he should have been a, a linebacker for, uh, for the Miami Dolphins or something, but he's a great jazz so, uh, vocalist. So, how about it for Miss, once again, for Miss Diane Monroe?
piece we're going to do before uh, we get to the signing. Um, um, it'll just be a blues. And A. And A. <laughs> and um, just play the head twice and let the drums out. Whatever. <laughs> See, for those of you who are, are musical aficionados, a lot of times when you sing the blues and jazz, the keys that come up are what? B flat, F, or in the early days, it used to be D flat because of the horns. Uh, so we're going to do a blues, but we're going to do it in A natural. <laughs> it's a little different, so we'll, we'll see how that sounds. Come on. You, you no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, after you, no, after you. No, after you. <laughs> <laughs> I insist. No, <laughs>
Sharp Trio. <laughs> Miss Jasmine Guy, stand up, stand up, stand up. Take a bow, take a bow, please. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Unbelievable. I'm <laughs> Avery Sharp, Avery Sharp. <laughs> Folks, don't forget, uh, if you're watching online, of course, we do have uh, Jasmine's backlist, uh, Afini Shakur, Evolution of a Revolutionary. We've got it out on the uh, counter for sale. If you could do me a big favor when you get up, if you could fold your chairs, it'll give you some room in here so you can meet and greet. And if you uh, want to see this again, you can watch it tomorrow. It's being recorded, so you can enjoy it again. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.